My name is Mike, and it's an honor that you would decide to join us today, wherever you are joining us from. If you are here for the very first time, we want to just welcome you. Let's go ahead and clap our hands for all of our first-time guests at all of our locations. You may be seated wherever you are standing. You'll take a purple U card that is located in the seat back around you, and you fill that out. Take that to the lobby on your way out today. We would love to be able to put a free gift in your hand. And uh, we are just excited that you've decided to join us today. I bring you greetings from Lakai's Haiti, where, uh, yeah, for the past eight days, 10 of your church friends and family were pushing back darkness. And uh, with kids ministry, VBS, uh, all sorts of preaching and teaching and fun stuff. And we were able to see God change lives in a very impactful way. And that would not be possible if it wasn't for your prayers. That would not be possible if you weren't interceding on our behalf when you enter into a world, into a country that might be a little darker, not knowing the gospel. And we thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your generosity. Because of your generosity, our partnership with 410 Bridge who's the organization that we partner with, is able to continue where they are uh, always educating the kids, teaching uh, young single mothers how to start their own businesses, helping them in a sustainable way. So it's not just like the 10 of us came in and left, but instead we're creating a sustainable model for ministry that is changing the community of Lakais. And if it wasn't for your generosity, that would not be possible. So thank you. When you give, you make that kind of thing happen. And it was very, very hot. Uh, let me tell you right now, it was hot. The climate was different there. The tropical, I could barely breathe. I carried this towel around with me all week long. Every picture you see, I have this towel somewhere close by so that I'm not sweating on these little children as I'm trying to do magic, card magic, and tell them about Jesus. And so it was really, really hot. The climate is different, and I believe that God is calling us to a climate change. That hints the title of my message today, which is a call to climate change. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Matthew 17. If you didn't bring a copy of God's Word, but maybe you have the YouVersion Bible app, inside that app, if you find the Live Events tab, you can look up Focus Church and follow along with today's message notes, and I would love uh, for you to do that. You can also add me on the YouVersion Bible app, plug at check the mic on YouVersion, and we can be friends, and you can watch all the verses that I highlight during the week, uh, and we can be you version friends uh, if you don't have a bible with you and you don't have the you version bible app that's okay our amazing crew has put it on the screens for us uh, matthew 17 just a little bit of context before we read in verse one jesus has not done anything that has been recorded to our knowledge for six days It's like six days of silence. It's six days of Jesus not having anything recorded. This account that we are about to read is in three of the four Gospels. And for six days, Jesus, there's no record of what Jesus has been doing. And a lot of times when Jesus is silent in your life, it's because he's setting you up for something significant. Oh, I said something today to a church that might be sleeping. When Jesus is silent, he is setting you up for something significant. It was on Saturday when he was buried where we have no record of anything that happened. But early on Sunday morning, mm, Jesus rose from the dead. So if God has been silent in your life, maybe it's a setup. Maybe it's a setup for something significant. Maybe his silence is just a setup for something significant today. Chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and he led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Verse 4, Peter exclaimed, this is the same Peter that cuts off the uh, ear of the high priest soldier. This is the same Peter that denies Jesus three times. This is the same Peter that later in the book of Acts defends the gospel. Peter interrupts a godly conversation and exclaims, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials. Some translations say as booths or tabernacles or tents. 
One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse 5, he gets completely ignored. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And the voice from the, from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and they fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touch them. I believe God wants to bring you into an intimate relationship with him today where you can experience the power of Jesus. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone. They saw only Jesus. My heart's desire for you, wherever you are joining us from today, is that you would not see a man preaching a sermon, that you would not hear men singing songs, but instead that you would hear and see the face of Jesus. Verse 9, as they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Let us pray today. Father, take us to that high place. Father, change the altitude of our spiritual condition today. Father, we don't want to stay in the valley if you've called us to the mountaintop. We want climate change. Take us to that place, Lord, where only we can experience your glory. God, we don't want to stay the same. We didn't come here to play church. We didn't come here just to play uh, games with you. We came here to experience and encounter the presence of an almighty God, a God that brings his glory, a God whose glory shines bright when we are led by you to that secret place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Do you remember the first time you realized that the person that you worked with wasn't the same person outside of work as they were inside of work? Uh, let me give you an example. Let's call him Steve. Cubicle Steve. Okay? You guys good with Cubicle Steve? Cubicle Steve does what he's told every day. He shows up with the uniform on, puts in all the spreadsheets, does all the data work. Cubicle Steve is uh, occasionally conversational with you. He might talk about sports or the weather. Cubicle Steve is very cordial. Well, we can even call him Water Cooler Steve. You know, Water Cooler and Cubicle. You guys have conversation. He's just a regular guy. You, you go home thinking that Steve is just a normal human being. And Cubicle Steve, around Christmas time, becomes Christmas Party Steve, where the eggnog is flowing. And you realize that the cubicle Steve and the Christmas party Steve are two different people. You think that they're two different people, but you're not seeing a fake version of cubicle Steve Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You're seeing only one side of Steve Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. When you go to the Christmas party, you're seeing Christmas party Steve. It's not a different Steve. It's another side of Steve that you've never seen before. This is what the disciples are experiencing on the Mount of Transfiguration. They know Jesus as their rabbi. They know Jesus as their teacher. They know Jesus as their leader. They know Jesus as the one who they believe to be the Messiah, but they aren't sure yet. They know that Jesus can do miracles, signs, and wonders, but they haven't seen the glory. They've only seen a preview of what a rabbi can teach them and do, but they haven't experienced his glory. And I don't want for you to ever only see one side of our Savior. Ain't nobody saying nothing in this service today. It would be a tragedy for you to only see the valley side of Jesus. It would be a tragedy for you to never live your life without experiencing the glorious nature of the presence of an almighty God. But in order for you to experience the glorious nature of his presence, you cannot stay in the valley. It calls for climate change. It calls for an altitude difference. It calls for you to separate yourself from that which you know and are comfort comfortable with and instead go to a higher place. I'm calling our church to a higher place this weekend. I'm calling you to a higher place where we're not satisfied with him as our rabbi or him as our teacher, even though he is all those things. I want to experience the glorious side of our Savior Jesus. 
call me selfish, but if the disciples were able to do that, I also want a part of that. If they were able to see that side of Jesus, I want to see that side of Jesus. And I believe that in order for you to see that side of Jesus, you are going to have to experience climate change. This mountain is the highest mountain surrounding the Sea of Galilee. The one that they go up is 9,000 feet above sea level, almost two miles. They say that it was not just a little uh, molehill. This was a mountain. And this trek wouldn't have just taken a couple of minutes. This would have been a long, treacherous journey that would have probably caused some grumbling, some complaining. They might have even cussed under their breath while Jesus was a little farther ahead of them. But in order for you to experience his glory in the high place, you have to know that a high place comes at a high price. You can't just get the glory with everybody else. But God has chosen you and called you. He has pulled you out and set you apart. And he has asked you to follow him to a high place. Notice that it says that Jesus led them to a high place. He didn't force them. He didn't bribe them. He didn't incentivize them. He led them there. I'm so grateful for a God that leads me. He doesn't force me, but he leads me. And when he leads me, I can choose how far I want to follow him. And if you want the glory, you got to go all the way because at a high price is the high place. Notice that Jesus has 12 disciples, but he only selects three. Why? Because there are some things that are not meant for everyone. There are some places in your life that not everybody can go. And the high place comes at a high price price and it's interesting how in our lives the high place can always be in competition with the low place you know I want to do these things but I'm drawn to do these things I want to do this but I'm torn and I'm stuck in this I want to be set free but I can't be set free of this one addiction that I have like the high place is always competing with the low place I'm called to be married, but I crave to be single. I call, I'm called to lead worship, but I crave fame and notoriety for myself. I'm called, but I crave. My calling and my craving are at odds, and I can't get to my calling if my craving is more important. As a matter of fact, I, 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 you can write this down if you're, if you're taking notes today, but an upward call will always compete with a downward craving. An upward call will always compete with a downward craving. What does that mean? That means that, that you're, you're called to serve, but you crave a busy schedule that keeps you away from the house of God. My upward call and my downward cravings are always in competition. I am... I am called to be a preacher. This one's personal, but I crave the prideful notor notoriety that comes with holding a microphone. And I can't have both. I can't have a significant encounter with the glory of God and a regular, everyday, downward craving being satisfied. You can't have both. And there's 9,000 feet in between them both. You got to decide, do I want the glory of the high place or do I want the guilt of the low place? Do I want the glory that comes from going up higher or do I want the guilt that comes from staying down lower? I want a church that goes higher. I want a people that goes higher. I want a congregation that knows that the glory is what we are after. Not our glory. Not our name, not our fame, but God's glory. And I love this story because it shows us a side of Jesus that you can only see when you get to the high place. You don't see this side of Jesus unless you get to a high place. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to heaven and experience his glory when I can experience his glory right now. It's too late. Eternity is awesome, and I cannot wait to be in heaven. But if I have the opportunity to experience heaven now, why wait? Why wait? And so God is calling this church, and when I say this church, I mean the people, not this place. I mean you, to a high place, to climate change. 
And you have to understand that when you go 9,000 feet up in the air, you go from it being probably hot and sunny to it being cloudy and cold. You have to be willing to experience the change in the seasons that happen when you begin to go to the high place. It is not the same up here as it is down there. That's why when you get closer to the equator like we were this week in Haiti, whoo, it makes you really want to go to heaven. And you really hope that heaven is somewhere near a mountaintop in Mount Everest, Iceland, cold, Greenland, Antarctica, anywhere but away from this equator, Lord, please. Why? Because we experience climate change, a change in elevation. We were closer to the sea. We were on an island near the equator. It was hotter. And it was really hot. But God is calling us higher. God is calling you higher. Because I believe God wants you to experience the secret place of the Most High. I believe he wants you to experience the shadows of his wings. And I want you to know that inside his glory is a high price. And that price is the journey up the mountain. So an upward call will always compete with a downward craving. Verse 2 says, as the men watched Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Oh, what a cool conversation that I wish I had access to. What do you talk about when you are Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. What do you what could you possibly say? You're not discussing whether or not Popeye's chicken sandwich is better than Chick-fil-A's chicken sandwich. You are Moses, the one that delivered the people of God out of captivity. You are you are Elijah, the one that we've been waiting for. The days of Elijah. Y'all know the song, The Days of Elijah? These are the days of Elijah. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes. You know that song? You're not saved unless you know that. That, that. that song was written in the high place. It's just a joke. So you have Moses, who represented God in the Old Testament. You have Elijah, who's the man of God that represents the future, the coming of the king. And you have Jesus, who is God now. Here you have both past and future talking to the present, like this is a powerful interaction between Old Testament, future coming of our king, and the king now. And, and Peter, James, and John are listening in. And Peter, we love you, Peter. You're so awesome. But when God is talking to Moses and Elijah, and you are newer to your discipleship journey, it's probably best that you just take notes. It's probably best that when God is speaking, you are listening. It's probably best that you not interrupt the, the goats that are having a conversation. Greatest of all time, G-O-A-T. It's probably important that you listen and take notes. But here we have Peter, the one who jumps the gun in the Garden of Gethsemane and cuts off the soldier's ear. The one who denies Christ three times, even, after, even when he knew he was going to do it. The same one who defended the faith and who, who redeems the local church in the book of Acts. So I don't want Peter just to look like he, he's, he's all lost. But he exclaims in mid-conversation, it's awesome to be here with you guys. When God is speaking, you should be listening. And what I've learned is that every time I'm talking, I'm not learning. Hello? Anytime I'm, I'm not learning anything right now. I'm just telling you what I've learned this week. So in order for me to teach you, I have to listen. Peter exclaims, mid-sentence with Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Isn't it wonderful for us to be here? If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Isn't that interesting? That his first response was to build something. 
His first response was to do something. His first attachment was to perform. And Jesus and Moses and Elijah and ultimately God the Father through the cloud ignore his suggestion completely. And this is testimony to the fact that you don't have to perform in the presence of God. You don't have to build anything. He loves you already how you are. Oh, he wants to love on you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. You don't have to build a monument because he wants to just have a conversation that you can listen in on. Now, I grew up in church where my parents never left church. And everyone else had already eaten lunch. And I wanted to go home with my friends. But I grew up where you weren't allowed to interrupt your parents when they were in the middle of conversation. I'm looking at the camera so you can look at the screens. When I was growing up, you couldn't interrupt your parents because they were having adult conversations. You guys know what I'm talking about? If I wanted to go home with Johnny because Johnny's parents were going to Lone Star for lunch, and we were probably going to go to CeCe's or somewhere way worse. <laughs> I always wanted to go home with my friend who was going to the best restaurant, knowing that we would get there on time and not for dinner, for lunch. If I stayed with my parents, it was for dinner. But in order for me to tell my mother where I was going, I could not interject because if I interrupted, there would be some eyes. And those eyes would become hands. And that hand would lay hands on me. But not in a prayerful manner, in a powerful manner. And I would be out in the Holy Ghost. But not slain in the spirit. Bruised in the flesh. I learned that when authority is speaking, I have to remain silent. I want to teach you today that God can never show you something if you're always talking. God can never teach you something if you're not listening. God can never refill you if you're not still. I have a friend of mine, he said, you know, you never go up to the counter and shake the cup for a refill underneath the thing. You have to leave the cup really, really still. In order to be filled, you have to be still. Peter is jumping the gun, trying to build something, trying to make something, trying to remember this moment. You're not called to build things. As a matter of fact, I got three quick observations. Never interrupt Jesus when he's speaking. Never impose your plans on his purpose. Oh, I'll just make a monument. Proverbs 19, 21 says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Your plans are not as critical as the purpose of God. This is important for you to realize. Because a lot of you think that you're the general contractor. That you're the general contractor of God's call on your life. Uh, that, you, that you actually have control over what God's plans and his purposes are. So you walk into your prayer closet with plans. You say, here I am, Lord. I know, that, I know that you're in charge, but guess what? I got plans. None of these have been thought through your purposes, but I want to build some monuments. One, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you. Jesus is probably thinking to himself, I, I, I'm the king of kings. You can't put my statue on the same level of Moses and Elijah. I am the one most high God. First and foremost, but that's a side note. You come into your prayer closet with plans. And you say, well, this is what I, this is what I want you to build, God. Just build, build, build my life on this. On my framework, on my timeline, with, with, these, with these barriers and these guardrails. And God looks at your plans, and though he's grateful for your effort. He wants to reveal his glory in a way that you can't put on paper. He wants to reveal his purpose for your life in a way that you can't imagine it. You can't draw it up. So stop trying to be the general contractor of your calling and start submitting your plans to his purpose and say, if it doesn't look like I thought it was going to look, I still will serve you. These are the plans for the Apex Campus. 
And one of the things that I've learned in this construction process is always build when you're young because I wouldn't be able to do this if I was any older. Seriously. Permits, inspections, things you'll never see, keeping us delayed for weeks. Things you'll never see. You'll never see that pipe. Who cares where that pipe is at? They're never, it doesn't keep them from heaven. Let's just put some speakers up. Let me preach. Well, that water fountain is a handicap accessible water fountain. It's got to go to the wrong corner. Take your plans, you know. There's this thing, if you don't pass inspection, that you have to submit to your general contractor. And it's called a change order. Now, that is a very expensive set of words. It's a very expensive set of words. So when they call me and say, Pastor Mike, the plumber just came and had to make a change order. The drywall guys just left. They had to make a change order. The electrical guy just showed up, and he says that the box is supposed to be here, but the plans say the box is supposed to be here, so we have to submit change I came to declare a change order in your life today. That you are no longer what you think you are, but instead God's purposes are greater than your plans. And you have limited God to your set of plans, and you've walked in, and you've just walked around wanting to to just kind of show God your, your plans. And God says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So while you're here on the mountaintop, just take notes. Just listen. Never interrupt Jesus when he is speaking. Never impose your plans on his purposes. And never idolize that what is meant to be mobilized. I want to build an idol for the three of you, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And the next words out of Jesus' mouth are so important. You have to get this. They don't even answer or acknowledge the suggestion. Oh, that might be good. Let's, let's, let's put a pin in that. Circle back around to that next week. You know, you've been in those brainstorming meetings where the worst idea comes to the table and you're like trying to be nice about it, but it's the worst idea you've ever heard. They just flat out ignored his suggestion because he was so used to the Old Testament way which was to build a marker or to build an altar or to build a statue or to take a stone. And, and he was so bound by law that his first instinct was to build something, to perform a sacrifice, or to do something. And what Jesus is showing, he's showing them the side of him that says, you don't have to build anything anymore. The next words out of Jesus' mouth are, get up. Get up. Get up. What Jesus is trying to say to us and what Jesus was saying to them was that this is not a monument. This is a movement. Church is not a monument. It is a movement. It is not Destiny Drive. It is not North Salem Street. It's not green. It's not black. It's not. It is a people of God passionately pursuing His glory. It is not a building. It's, li- it's not limited by location. It can be in Haiti. It could be in Apex. It could be in Garner. It could be wherever you want. Why? Because the church is no longer a monument. It is a movement. And guess what doesn't move? The brick and mortar that we are surrounded with. But guess what does? The people in this room. Get up. Get up. Get up. Do not be afraid. I'm calling you to a movement today. This church needs to become a movement and not a monument. I'm calling you to worship in spirit and in truth. I'm calling you to a higher place. I don't want you to live in the low place as your pastor. I don't want you to get to the end of your life and say there must have been more. There could have been more. If this was all God's glory I experienced in heaven, why didn't I get at least a taste of that here on earth? I want to let you know that this is not a monument. You didn't come to worship a statue. You didn't come to work and worship a carven image. You came to worship a movement. The movement of his spirit that is active, alive, and breathing living on the inside of you and if you don't acknowledge that it's a movement you'll want to stay at the top of the mountain you'll want to just camp there I met a lot of people that just want to camp near a monument of what was 
They want to camp near a monument of a moment. And every time God tries to do something new, they go back to what they know. My Bible says you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. So Jesus completely ignores his suggestion or request to build a monument. And here's what they do instead. Instead, this is what they do. I'm closing with this. 17, 5 through 9, it says, but even as he spoke, speaking of Peter, just in the middle, just God's like, all right, Peter, thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> a bright cloud overshadowed them. And the voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him, Peter. Listen to him, James. Listen to him, John. Church, we need to turn our listening ear to the high place. The disciples were terrified and they fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when he looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone. They only saw Jesus. Verse 9, as they went back down the mountain. What? You mean I can't stay here? I like it here. I saw glory here. I saw Jesus here. I saw Moses here. I saw Elijah here. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone you have seen until the Son of Man has, risen, has been raised from the dead. Exodus 19, 19 through 21 says, as the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses knows about climbing. He's a climbing expert. So Moses climbed the mountain. Direct obedience. You'll find a lot of direct obedience in the life of Moses. Verse 21, then the Lord told Moses, go back down. I just came up here. I just got here. I like this glory cloud. I like this glory. I like this moment. It makes me feel good. Jesus, God says, go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord or they will die. First Kings 19, 15, talking about Elijah who was on a mountaintop hiding in a cave. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came. And travel in the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Haziel to be the king of Aaron. All three of those guys that were talking never camped out on the mountaintop. They all had to come back down. <laughs> we would love to live in the age of Brownsville revival again, Pastor. Bring Brownsville back. We can't stay there, y'all. Bring Toronto revival back, Pastor. It's like Toronto. You built a monument at a place where God's called us to be a movement. I want it to be like the Lakeland outpouring. I want it to be like Bethel and Redding. I want it to be like Elevation. Let us not, let us not get stuck camping on the top of the mountain. Let us not get stuck camping on the top of the mountain. Here's what I've realized. Glory is not somewhere I camp. It is something that I carry. Glory is not somewhere I camp. It is something that I carry. You've been, ca you've been camping out far too long, church. You've been camping out, making monuments. You've been carving statues about moments that you've had with God and God wants to reveal himself in a new and a fresh way and it's not just for you it's so that you can carry the glory back down to the bottom help the people in the low place tell them about God the God of the high place the glory of God of the high place he is not going to reveal himself to you just for you he is revealing himself to you for the sake of those around you and if you stay on the mountaintop, it will be a click. It will be a cluster. It will be a group of people who just worship the carven idols. It's time to move. It's time to go. It's time to see a side of Jesus we've never seen before in the high place. And I believe that Jesus was very intentional. He knew that what the glory was going to show couldn't be exposed to everyone. That's why he needed to isolate three of the twelve. This is Jesus saying that I can reveal myself in a certain way in a smaller setting than I can in a larger setting. That happens nowadays. You can see Jesus from a different perspective in the context of small groups. If you want to see a new side of Jesus, you need to get connected in relationship with people who are after the same thing as you. 
This is Life Group Launch Sunday, and I believe that it is imperative and important for us to note that Jesus selected three men of the 12 to even get to a smaller group of people so that he could reveal a side of himself that nobody had ever seen before. I would hate for you to live your entire life only seeing the side of Jesus on Sunday morning. Because God wants to do something in your life relationally that he can't do on a Sunday morning. He wants to show you and reveal to you his glory on the high place in a, in, a, in, a, in a small group that you can then take back down the mountain and survive in the low place. Because you've been with people who encountered God with you in the high place. It's imperative that you don't just see one side of Jesus, but you see the, all of him. And I believe through small groups, you will see a different side. Through life groups, you will see another side. Pastor, I'm really busy. Well, the low place is a busy place. Pastor, my kids got sports almost every night of the week. The low place is a busy place. I'm calling you to a high place. The climate of your schedule has to change. The climate of your spiritual temperature has to change. And the only way it changes is if you pull yourself apart and be led by Christ up the mountain.